Judges 3.31. In Judges 3.31, you got a very interesting character named Shamgar. A really unknown character. You go up to the average guy and say, what do you think of Shamgar? They're going to look at you like you're crazy. I already tried it a few times this week. They all looked at me like I was crazy. But in Judges 3.31, it says, And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Shamgar is the third judge of Israel, and he's a great Bible warrior. Though he's only mentioned in two verses total, we learn some great truths about Shamgar. Shamgar's name means the, the desolate dragged away one. The desolate dragged away one. What a name. You know, the, this shows that Shamgar overcame the expectations of his life. Shamgar's story is a true underdog story. He overcomes the expectations against him, as you're going to see. Shamgar lived in perilous times. Look, just turn over to Judges 5 and look at 6 through 8. Judges 5, 6 through 8, it says, In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages seized, they seized in Israel, until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? So he's in a time where they're not walking. They're not going through the highways. They're going through byways. He's living in a time where Israel's chosen new gods. And as you know, it's the book of Judges. So what does the book of Judges say that every man was doing? Every man was doing that which was right in his own eyes. So Shamgar, he's living in perilous times just like me and you. He's in perilous times. He, he can't even walk down the street without running into something that's going to cause him trouble. He's living in a time where people have new gods. He's living in a time where every man's doing that which was right in his own eyes. So, and after him, it says, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath. So, Shem's father was Anath, or Anath. And I read that Anath was also the name of a female Canaanite goddess. So, was... Shamgar's father named after this Canaanite goddess? If so, possibly Shamgar came out of uh, this type of pagan life. Just like me and you, we came out of a horrible pagan life. You know, I'm, I'm sure most of the people listening to me, there was a time where you didn't care about God, you didn't care about the Bible, and you had chose for yourself new gods that came newly up that your fathers never knew, most likely. But then you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you got saved, and now you're no longer worshiping false gods. But that's, that's Shamgar. So let's look at some things about Shamgar. Look there at verse 31, then let's read it. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines six hundred men with an ox goat, and he also delivered Israel. So look at the first two words, and after him. 
after who? Well, after Ehud. Ehud was the, the last judge before Shamgar. But Shamgar, the first thing about him was he's willing to pick up the mantle. Look, it says, and after him, after Ehud. Shamgar was willing to follow in Ehud's footsteps to deliver Israel. Think about yourself. Are you willing to follow in someone's footsteps? You see the your pastor, whoever it is in your life, good Christians, are you willing to follow in their footsteps? Are you willing to pick up the mantle? Or when they die off, is everything just going to die off? That's what was going on in Israel. You know, the the judge would die, and then Israel would get, everybody in Israel would just get away from God, and then God would have to raise up a deliverer to get them out of the horrible situation they were in. But Shamgar was willing to pick up the mantle. You know, you don't, picking up the mantle doesn't mean that you have to outdo the ones who went before you. You know, you do have characters like Elijah, and he did twice the miracles as his mentor Elijah. You know, there are situations like that. You know, Joshua got Israel into the promised land, though Moses didn't get him in the promised land. You got situations like that. But it's not about trying to outdo the person before you. It's about learning from them, taking what they've learned and learning your own your own things, taking it further than they went. But it's not about outdoing them. And the Lord says in Matthew 16, 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Are you willing to pick up the mantle? Are you willing to pick up the cross and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in perilous times like Shamgar. You probably came out of paganism like Shamgar. You're probably an unknown nobody like Shamgar. Shamgar's been in the Bible for thousands of years. Still nobody knows who he is. How, do, how would that make you feel? You know, everybody knows who uh, these horrible people are today like Taylor Swift, and all these people like that, that they worship people like that, but they have no idea who Shamgar is. You go up to the average preacher, you're like, and say, I love Shamgar's story. They're going to be like, who's that? But Shamgar was willing to pick up the mantle. Elijah, willing to pick up the mantle, did twice the miracles. Joshua, Willing to pick up the mantle, got him into the promised land. So, are you willing to pick up the mantle? And then number two, Shamgar is a warrior at heart. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew the Philistines 600 men. Shamgar slew the Philistines 600 men with an ox, ox goad. In a time when people weren't going walking the highways, they were so afraid of these Philistines, so afraid of what was around the corner. But if, if you fear men, you won't fear God, and if you fear God, you won't fear men. That's a great saying that many people have said. It's probably wore out by now, but it's still a great saying. And with the help of the Lord, Shamgar beat the odds, as many others did in the Scriptures. He beat the odds. For example, you look over in Judge or in Genesis 14, 9 through 16. Let's go over there real quick. Genesis 14, 9 through 16. I'm going to show you some examples of people that beat the odds. The first one's Abraham. In Genesis 14, 9, it says, with Chedorlaomer, the king of Elam, and with Tidal, king of nations, and with and Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Eleazar, four kings with five. So you got these four armies. 
And the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain, and they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and their victuals and went their way. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and there were confederate with Abram. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, look at this, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. So Abram hears that Lot's been taken, and he gets his trained servants together, the ones he had trained himself, 318 of them. And he's going to go save Lot. See, any plot that Hollywood comes up with just ain't even original. You know, any movie where somebody's been taken and somebody's got to come save them, well, you've already got that in the Bible. Abram's doing that. You know, you got movies like 300. Well, right here, you got Abram's 300. You know, history repeats itself. Hollywood doesn't have an original thought. It says, And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued, pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. So you see, Abraham, a warrior at heart, beat the odds, just like Shamgar. Took on four armies with 318 men. Look at Second Chronicles 14, 8 through 13. Second Chronicles 14, 8. It says, And Asa had an army of men that bear targets and spears. Out of Judah, 300,000. And out of Benjamin that bear shields and drew bows, two hundred and four score thousand. All these were mighty men of valor. So Asa, he's got about 580,000 men. And there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with an host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots and came unto Marisha. So he, he's got about 500 and something thousand. And here comes these Ethiopians. A million of them. A million Ethiopians. But then Asa went out against him. And they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephatha at Marisha. And look at what Asa does. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let no man, let not man prevail against thee. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gerar, and the Ethiopians were overthrown, that they could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. Imagine the spoil you would get when you took everything out of those Ethiopians' pockets, a million of them, and the stuff they left behind. But Asa beat the odds because of the Lord. Samson, another judge, just like Shamgar, Samson is another judge that beats the odds in Judges 15, 14 through 16. It says in Judges 15, 14, And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became his flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loof loose from off his hands and he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith and samson said with the jawbone of an ass heaps upon heaps with the jaw of an ass 
have I slain a thousand men. He beat the odds. Samson and a jawbone versus a thousand men. Asa and 500 and something thousand versus a million Ethiopians. Abraham and his 318 servants versus four armies. You see, with God on your side, you can be a warrior at heart because you got him in you and you can beat the odds. If you're fearing God and danger arises, you'll have peace. And Philippians 4.13 is still true now. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. It was true before Paul wrote it. And Shamgar is an example of four, or Philippians 4.13 before it was written. He was willing to pick up the mantle. He's a warrior at heart. And the next thing is, he wields an unlikely weapon. He wields an unlikely weapon. Shamgar, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew of the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad. You know, Samson had that unlikely weapon, a jawbone of an ass. Shamgar's got an ox goad. You know, that over there in Judges 5, what did it say? It said in uh, 5, 7, the inhabitants of the villages seized. They seized in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or a spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? So Shamgar must not have had a, real weapon so he's using an unlikely weapon he's using an ox goad and i read that an ox goad means the thing that teaches it means the thing that teaches and in ecclesiastes 12 and verse 11 you got a great verse that goes along with the word goads, it says, The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the master of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. The words of the wise are as goads, and it means the thing that teaches. The ox goad is, was used to spur or guide the oxen. You know, if they get... If they start getting slow, he would take that ox goad and use it to get them oxen working again. It's used to round up the cattle. You see, the Lord goads us. He has to goad us. The Lord's a shepherd. He has to gird up, goad us. And Shamgar's obviously a herdsman. He's a worker. And you know what the Lord told um, Paul in Acts 9, 5? He says, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. It's hard for him to you know, kick against the goads. It's sharp. It's hard for him to kick against those pricks. You know, it's hard for me and you when we open the Bible and it goes against us. It's hard for us to kick against the pricks. Now, if you keep kicking against it, your skin's going to get tougher and tougher, and it ain't even going to bother you no more. But when you got your heart soft towards the Bible, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. In Shamgar, he must have been a herdsman, and the Lord likes a worker. If, he, if you can go to get up and go to work and work with your hands, most likely you're going to be willing to work for him with your hands. Those are the ones he can teach. Somebody that works with their, their hands is someone the Lord can take and teach and really use. In Psalm 144 and verse 1, it says, A psalm of David, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. Shamgar was a very teachable guy, it seems, and the Lord used him. And he obviously taught his hands to war and his fingers to fight. Or he couldn't have 
took on 600 Philistines. Shamgar used what he had at the present moment to do a work that he would reap for eternity. I mean, he, he used that ox goat that he presently had in his hand, and now I'm talking about it thousands of years later. Samson had a jawbone. Moses had a rod. You've got what you've got. You know, you've got all kinds of things at your disposal to do something for God. You know, I've got this phone with a voice record app on it, and I can get up early in the morning and record these lessons and put them out there to maybe help somebody, teach somebody the Bible. You know, we have access to so many Bibles. You know, it says in Psalms, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Why don't you use that two-edged sword in your hand? Why don't you use all the opportunities that God's given you to do something for Him? You wield an unlikely weapon. You also have an unlikely, unlikely weapon, and that is the way most people would see your Bible today, an unlikely weapon. But Hebrews 4.12, what does it call it? A sharp sword. And the Lord prods you with it. He prods you with his goad. That's the word of God. The words of the wise are as goads. Ecclesiastes 12.11. You know, an ox pictures a pastor. You know, Paul talks about, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Talking about, you know, don't starve your pastor out. You know, he's worthy of his hire. So an ox goad. It's an unlikely weapon. Shamgar wields an unlikely weapon. But the last thing is, you know, he's, he's willing to pick up the mantle. He's a warrior at heart. He wields an unlikely weapon. But look what happens. He wins the battle. And after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, which slew the Philistines 600 men with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. He wins the battle. You already have the victory. You just need to use what is in your hand to, 